All right. Welcome, everybody, to the ninth stream of DBB Live. Hope you've all had a great day so far. Ready to talk some Detroit basketball. I'm Wes Davenport from Motor City Hoops, Detroit Bad Boys, and I am joined by the Aussie himself, as always, Jack Kelly from Detroit Bad Boys. And Jack, how you doing? Wes, I'm great. I I'm I'm so happy we finally got some some news to discuss, some exciting news. I've brought out the teal jersey today. I'm just excited to chat. We've got a new head coach in Detroit, Monty Williams, which happened very quickly in the past couple, in the past 48 hours. So I think the majority of fans are we're still. I know I'm still a bit not in shock, but just from where we were 48 hours to go with the coaching search, to now wind up with Monty Williams. It's pretty exciting. So excited to dive into it. Yeah, I don't know the reports and everything really went quick it was what 6 p.m or something like that where we we get from the athletic that they're going to make a big offer and then a few hours later we're in right so as you just saw uh bryce jumping in here uh, we couldn't be more excited to, to be joined by bryce Simon from motor city hoops and he just got done uh doing with me as well the the uh pistons pulse live stream too which was awesome so if any of you guys were in that and now joining this thank you twice bryce uh how are you feeling about all the news um it's been a whirlwind right and like i feel like we just were like scatterbrained and i just can't help but think about amari and james and mike you know those guys are that's their job and you know their phones are blowing up and they're trying to get information out and not be behind and all of those things you know and it's just you think about since getting to know amari i've realized yeah there's a lot of really cool stuff with that job but just think about that like we're all sitting in our living room, six, seven o'clock last night, the news comes out and like, we just get on Twitter and interact. Omari has to write an article and try to interact on Twitter and make sure his facts are straight. Cause if you mess that up, that is really bad. So um, it's exciting for us, but I, I, you know, just, I appreciate those guys so much and what they do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. And all right. So, let, let's talk, let's talk Marty Williams. Let's open it up with that. So the reported details, at least that we know, it's six years, $78.5 million. Team options for an additional two years after that could get uh, up to or over uh, $100 million if he stays for eight years. So that's a massive financial commitment from the Pistons. What are our thoughts on Monty Williams? How does it affect draft, free agency, anything like that? Just general open floor. Go ahead, Bryce. Yeah, I mean, I'm the one that was like, I don't want to talk about the coaching hire. I don't care. We don't know anything about these guys. The thing with Monty Williams is we at least know a little bit, right? He's been a head coach in this league very recently, coached some good teams. And so there's at least reports and information on what does he do offensively? How does he handle young players? What he is his development? You know, how does he interact with his players? So that... <laughs> That I hope you need to get some sleep after this thing, Gary. Like I respect it, but then you need to get some sleep. That's good for the body. But no, I mean, it, it gives us something to talk about. It's, it's exciting. I think what's really cool is like just the excitement that the fan base has now. It was just so sad after the way the season ended and how the lottery went. And now there's some excitement. And I can't help but think that that played a little bit into Gore's making sure this happened because – just look what Twitter did last night, guys. Jack, can you guys imagine what would have happened if they would have landed the number one pick in this lottery? Look what happened last night just hiring Monty Williams. So um, it's just really cool to have this much excitement going around. Yeah, for sure. In many ways, it felt like the Pistons had 
won a playoff game or something last night. Like it was, it was crazy. And just, you touched on it Bryce earlier, but just to jump back to like the beat reporters and people reporting on this, like, I know when I try and write an article, if I've got any adrenaline running through my system, like it is so hard. So I like that shout out there. But um, for me, man, like I touched on it earlier. I think landing Monty Williams is, it's, it's significant, obviously, because he's a, he's a proven coach. He's been to the NBA finals. I think in the past three seasons, he's the league's most winningest coach. So say what you want about the roster, but the facts are he is currently one of the league's top coaches. Um, so just to get a guy like that to come to Detroit, um, shout out to Tom Gores. He's had his detractors and, and whatever, but for him to just throw, I believe, I could be wrong, it's the highest salary for a coach in history maybe. Yeah, I, I might have to fact check that, but at least in the league right now, for him to go stuff it, we're getting this guy and give him an offer he can't refute. I think for Pistons fans, that should excite them for the future of this team as well, that their owner is willing to spend and spend big to make things happen. And I think with Gores, since becoming the owner, he's always been a win now guy. And to the detriment of the franchise in the past decade, he's had to learn to take a step back. But I feel like right now with where the franchise was sitting, his intent on making a big splash is really the right move for this team. And Williams, is that coach a lot of guy a lot of people wanted Kenny Atkinson or a coach to sort of help get the Pistons from the bottom to that competitive range? And I really feel like Monty Williams is the guy to do that. We saw what he did with the Suns in his first season. Um, I believe Amari on the Pistons Pulse said just earlier that he took the Suns defense from bottom of the league to like 17th in his first season alone. So um, we'll dive into it more, but that's just my initial thoughts. It, it's a really exciting moment. So I've been thinking about this, and, and I know there's questions around the way Tom Gores has made his money and all that. And I, I, without getting into that, I know a lot of people like hate that Gores doesn't live in Detroit and those things. Part of me is like, I like what Tom Gores does as an owner in terms of when the money needs to be there, he puts the money up. I feel like he tries to make big name hires and those type of things. And then other than that, he's just not in the picture and he lets other people do their thing. Like I kind of like that as an owner. Um, I know like the other swing is Mark Cuban who's sitting courtside, but I'm okay if my owner is essentially just the money guy, right? And I don't know all the decals and intricacies of things, but just kind of big picture of who he is as the owner of the Pistons. That doesn't bother me. You know, Wes, you guys are lifelong Pistons fans, though. Wes, you live in the area. Does that bother you a little bit more? I know we're a little off topic here, but I do think some of this is about Tom Gores. Does that ever bother you guys that he doesn't live in Detroit? He's not always there. He's a little more hands off in general type of thing. No, um, not not me. I mean, I've liked that he's been hands off. And I think that he does probably the the one main thing that other than the money that, that you need your owner to do, which is the only times he's stepped in on personnel decisions were to stop whoever the GM was from like making a mistake. So the big one from way, way back, Van Gundy was going to trade Andre Drummond for like Willie Cauley Stein at 14 or something like that. And Tom Gores went, no, 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 maybe, maybe, maybe don't do that. I know. I think uh, at the time it came out too, that he helped a little bit with the, the Blake Griffin move. So like, the only times he's ever stepped in on personnel were really big things that could have gone really poorly if it didn't play out in exact correct way. And other than that, he's just footed as much money as possible and uh, otherwise pretty much stayed out of everything. So I I've never really had a big issue with Tom Gores. I like the absent owner. I know Davidson was, was great before him though. Um, and he was a little more active. So that was before my time mostly, but I, I really get it um, from more long-time Pistons fans that might have been used to something different. I mean, I couldn't care less. He doesn't live in Detroit. I live in Australia. <laughs> so. but, no, I think it's a great – it's a good question because I see a lot of stuff about that on Twitter. Uh, but the last thing I'll say on Gores is with these new CBA agreements coming in or coming in, I think, this off-season, the fact – I mean, I just I think, think this is – Fans should be really excited about the prospect of Tom Gores putting his money where, where his mouth is in terms of spending into the tax. I don't think 
that will be a question for him if this team is worth paying into the tax. Um, so I think fans should be excited. And there's Kyle confirming this off season. Um, and I believe, are yeah. you guys having Keith Smith on the Pistons pulse soon? Yeah. So I'm sure you guys will break it all yeah. down there. Keith will record with us live on Sunday and then next Wednesday when the podcast drops. Uh, and Kyle may correct me here. I think some of the super tax or what actually Keith Smith has pegged as a super tax is going to roll over time. Yeah. So some of those things are going to slowly work in to give teams a chance not to be hamstrung them right off the bat. Like they're going to have, give them a chance. Right. So I think a lot of the things that are going to weigh are the super tax teams with what they are able to do when you go way over the cap. But yeah, Jack, I mean, I don't know. I, I just, I think what you actually want your owner to do, Tom Gores does in terms of putting his money there. And like you say, Wes stepping in and some of the bigger decisions, you know, a lot of people didn't want Kevin Ollie. It sounded like that's who Troy Weaver wanted initially. And Gores may have said no or whatever. And then Gores put up the money to go get the guy that he wanted instead. And, you know, maybe a better hire in general. And if you guys saw me leave, I had to get tater tots out of the <laughs> oven and in three minutes and eight seconds, I got to go get the burgers off the grill. The, the, our ha our family's all over the place right now, but I didn't want to miss this. That yeah, we appreciate you. Um, I guess in terms of Monty Williams, um, what are your guys' thoughts on just how he can help this team day one? Um, there's been a lot of chatter about the 0.5 offense. Um, one of the things I noted from just going through and having a look at some of the play types and that in synergy was um, the Suns rarely iso last season, isolation plays. That was right down the bottom. So um, in Monty's first season with the Suns as well, there's 11 play types synergy has. Isos were dead last in his first season as coach. So I'm not saying we won't see isolations, but that was something Detroit featured a lot and – I just want to preface this by saying that's not all on Dwayne Casey. I think it's a personnel thing. Um, but, yeah, how do you guys think day one sort of Monty Williams helps his team? Yeah, I just want to point out real quick that Dwayne Casey did want to run a read and react offense that was just flow and – it didn't. Now, here's the thing. And, and again, if you want to critique Dwayne Casey, there's an art to teaching players that, right? And demanding. And maybe Coach Casey, I don't know, but maybe he didn't do a good job of it. And it looks like Monty Williams does. But I just want to point out that that's something they've been trying to do. And it just wasn't very effective. And part of that, guys, is if you don't have players that can do it, it looks really, really bad. And so it's it's not an easy thing to do just to have a feel and play off one another when there's not a set rule on what happens. And so I do think there's going to see be some rough possessions early in this thing. But no, I'm, I'm glad you went and looked at that synergy stuff, Jack, because I'm going to try to dive into it more tomorrow as well and just watch some of the field goal attempts and how the ball moves and and all of those things. I think it's exciting. I think it'll be fun to watch. Um, I'm interested to see how fast this team's played early on as well. I know there was a talk in these playoffs, Wes, when Chris Paul was playing, they played super slow. And one reason why they had some success when he was out was because he wasn't there and Shaman or whoever was pushing the ball a little bit more. No, I think um, this, this is going to be a really, really little thing, but you know, day one, there's not a whole load up where he's implementing a bunch of sets or systems. Right. So I think day one, Honestly, the most important thing he's going to bring is just a different voice, different voice in the locker room, different leadership style. It's kind of a fresh start for a lot of these young guys. And I'm not saying like Dwayne Casey did a bad job. I was a noted Casey supporter for a long time. But just when, when you get this kind of changing of the guard, changing of leadership, it can rejuvenate some guys. And I think that is going to have a pretty big impact, like literally the moment he walks through the facility doors and starts talking to guys uh, and, and getting their vibe on what their expectations are going to be moving forward. So I, I know it's a really little thing. I'm not trying to give like a cop-out answer, but I, I think that could have a really big impact, especially on some of the 22 and unders on the roster. I think that's an excellent point, Wes, and, and something else we spoke about literally before hopping on and spoken about in the past is just the pressure um, in the early going, just how an established coach like Monty Williams will be able to, if this team does get off to a bit of a slower start, um, obviously a six-year contract helps as well, but Monty Williams has done this. He's yeah. been a coach for a decade plus. He's been a player in the NBA. He, he can handle the pressure and scrutiny that, maybe a first-time head coach would really struggle with. 
Um, so I think that helps. And, and I just think he's a, he's clearly a born leader. This, uh, the players will respect him and um, having a new voice. And for a lot of these guys, um, yeah, just a new coach and a new voice, new energy. Um, I think, we'll, I think that's a really good point to raise. Um, but I think we should probably get into some questions. After all, the show is for the fans. So we've got a ton of questions. We're going to try and get to these as best as possible. Um, so the first one I'll open up with here is from Henry. Hey, y'all. How do you think Monty keeps it? Do you think Monty keeps any assistance from last season's Pistons team? All right. I think so. This was something that came up on the Pistons Pulse uh, stream that we did as well. And Omari brought up that, you know, a lot of times new coach, new assistants, a lot of turnover. The guy, the guy bringing in that you're bringing in usually has a lot of connections right uh, around the league and they've got their own guys. They've got full control of their staff. So I think that that's probably most likely to happen in terms of like, the big names um, on the Pistons bench, you know, the the right and left hand man for for Dwayne Casey, which would have been Jerome Allen and and Rex Kalamian. I'd said this like a while ago. I don't think that they're likely to stick around. Just coming from the perspective, if you were just the head, like you just got hired as a head coach, and you have the former head coach technically above you in the front office still uh still helping to make decisions here and there like would you really want that former head coach's second and third in command on your bench with you i'd be a little nervous about that it just doesn't seem uh the most supportive from an organizational standpoint so i i kind of think it'd be pretty much an all-new staff maybe some of the low-level guys well not no low level but more entry level guys that are newer maybe they stick around too to fill roles but yeah i'd say expect probably a, a new new staff top to bottom yeah uh, i would say definitely on the front the front bench the three guys that sit alongside the head coach i uh, i would be surprised if they remained um but i think wesley covered it really well there um the next question here is from victor what makes you most excited about the Monty hire? For me, it's seeing him utilize Cade and Ivy within the 0.5 second offense. Yeah, well, I think what he can do with Cade is especially exciting. I mean, a guy that uh, some people even compared Cade to back on his draft night is a guy that Monty Williams made look really, really good uh, for the Suns for a few years there with Chris Paul. So, I mean, if you can get maybe similar production, even more scoring, that'd be really exciting. So I, I'd be all for uh, Kate and Ivy is the answer to this. Um, but th this is a, another little thing. But when when the hire came out and it was all announced that this is this was actually going to happen, uh, the one of the footnotes in it was that he really was only interested in two jobs, the Pistons and I think the Bucks. And the fact that we were even on the list – makes me really excited about the money hire, you know, because it, it kind of shows that they didn't just throw the bank at him and he went, well, fine, sure. If you give me that much money, I'll come coach. Like he did, he did want to come to Detroit. So I feel like that level of commitment from a, uh, from a coach of this caliber is really exciting uh, to get that in, in the door. So that, that'd Absolutely. probably be my answer. And I believe Monty was also the coach when Chris Paul was in New Orleans for a period there. Dating back. I think you're right. Yeah, he was. So he had a, I'm pretty sure, I'm not sure if it was all of CP3's tenure, but I know he was definitely the coach there when they made the playoffs in like 2011 and Chris Paul was an MVP candidate. And so he knows how to mold young guards or at least young, young great guards are going to be great regardless. He knows how to put a system around them. And after talking to some Suns people, I posted a tweet before, but one of the things that, um, a comment that I thought was was just awesome for Pistons fans was he's, they said uh, Monty's a mastermind of setting advantages in the pick and roll with spacing around it. The spacing there is key for me because we've, we saw the two big experiment. Um, I know Damon Allred, uh, who works for DBB as well as the Phoenix Suns SB Nation. So he noted that Monty did at times trial out a two big lineup with Jock Landau and John Ayton in very, very small spurts. But 
I don't think Monty Williams is going to compromise the spacing around Cade Cunningham and Jaden Ivey unless there's a real um, – look, I guess I'd be shocked if he didn't emphasise spacing around a pick-and-roll threat like Cade Cunningham. So I think from that point of view, um, yeah, I think Cade – this will really help Cade and, and Jaden as well. I think I'll be interested to see how Jaden's used alongside Cade Cunningham. Dwayne Casey didn't really get the opportunity – to play, to field those two together, apart from the first 10 games. So be interested to see how Jaden's used off ball. I think he's got a lot of potential there. So, um, yeah, I think it's very exciting for Detroit's backcourt. Um, Bryce, did you have any thoughts on the utilisation of Cade and Ivy under Monty? No, I mean, I think it'll be exciting. You and With the risk of repeating anything you guys said, I mean, I think he's still going to run enough ball screen stuff that you're going to see Kate in those things, Ivy in those. I thought Ivy was a lot better in ball screens than what people thought he would be in his rookie season. Even Killian can use ball screens, right? He doesn't create advantages without those quite as well. So I think we'll still see plenty of ball screens, probably less than what Detroit this last year because Detroit was like top three in the league. But I think it'll be fun. I think it'll be interesting to see. I think it fits Cade really, really well because he is such a high processor. For sure. All right. We've got a lot of questions here, so let's try and get through these. Um, the next question is from KDA1024. Considering Monty's 0.5 second offense, is the play for Jarris Walker or Asar Thompson now at five? Yeah, I mean, I think the player that gets the most boost is actually Anthony Black. Like if you're just talking about where they were before the Monty Williams hiring to where they might be after the Monty Williams hiring, I think it's Anthony Black. Now the one that takes the biggest hit is obviously Cam Whitmore. He brings up a good point or she that it could be, you know, Jairus Walker just seems like the one that really fits this because again, high processing, but Anthony Black, again, I've already said it, Sam Vecini has said the highest processor, highest field guy in the class. And so if this is really where it's going to go, if it's really that big of an impact, I would say Anthony Black has taken the biggest just leap in terms of pre and post Monty Williams hiring. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Anthony Black because now I don't have to. And I'm the noted Anthony Black uh, supporter on this uh, live stream. So, yeah, no, I think, uh, like you said, if he's going to have any impact, it's probably elevating some of those high, higher processing, higher field guys when all things are otherwise equal. So you'd be looking at guys that were like on your own personal boards, because we'll never really know how, how Monty's going to rate them. But on your own boards, if they're pretty much coin flip could go either way, maybe in that situation, you're looking at the higher processor. So if you've got, you know, uh, Jairus and Whitmore like neck and neck at five, then you'd probably be looking at Jairus Walker there. Um, yeah. Yeah, you guys have covered it well. I, I personally don't think Monty's hiring will have a major impact on who the Pistons select. Like, of course, you'll have input and it will be obviously considered. But to answer the question, Jarvis Walker, yeah, the high processing's there. But I've said this from the start. He just feels like a Troy Weaver prospect, to be honest. I don't know why. I've just got this feeling that Troy would absolutely love Jarvis Walker on this team. So I think if you factor in the 0.5 second offense or the how Monty wants to play, maybe he's the guy at five. And, um, yeah, I, I would be – yeah, I think Jarvis Walker would fit this team amazingly. So I just want to say I feel like that – people won't like the way you got to these three bigs, the ones I'm going to talk about, but I, again, would be super excited about a three-big rotation of Duran, Stu, and Jarvis Walker – you got a lot of holes on the wing still, so you'd have to do something there. But I just think all of them can play together in different combinations. You have a little bit of everything. And so I just want to say that I, I would be really excited about that. Is that what you wanted with the top five pick? I don't know. But I'm just saying I think that would be a really nice combination of three bigs. And then Bagley and Wiseman have to figure it out. Oh, I'm on. Oh, now, yeah, now Wes is on mute. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I was trying to unmute you. <laughs> Next question uh, for KDA once again. 
Do you think the Pistons will obtain another first round pick? So I, I think it's Boyan, right? It, you could trade Boyan and maybe get that. And then the other thing is trading back. I think I'm a little bit more okay with trading back than a lot of people are. But, you know, there's a couple teams there that you could look to trade back. Utah at nine. I remembered it on this one, Wes, what team it was. I for brain farted and forgot. But, no. you know, you could trade back with Utah. They have 16. They have future first round picks. I mean, I, I think those are the two avenues that I can see. I, I don't think there's anybody else on the roster that you would trade that would warrant you a first round pick, right? You're not going to trade Kate Ivy Duran. I don't think anybody else. And that's a first rounder. So those are the two ways you, you move on from Boyan or you trade back. Yeah, for me, I think this is kind of, it's the same hesitancy I, I have on if they'd even make the pick at 31. And it's just that I'm not sure based on the the narrative that they're pushing, right, that they want to take a leap, that they want to make improvements, get better, be not a 17-win uh, season ideally next year, that I'm just not sure they'd be super excited about adding, like, two 19-year-olds that are going to get heavy minutes uh, with, with two first-round picks. So my gut says no. I mean, I'm not basing that on anything much more than that, but I just I, I kind of would be shocked at uh, I don't know. I, I feel like they don't really want to do it. I don't know. What do you think, Jack? I don't know. I could see pick five being traded. Um, I don't know. No. I, I lean towards thinking, like, in order for the Pistons to get another first-round pick, I think it would be probably by trading pick five. Sorry to clarify my answer. Um, but I, I think ultimately they use pick five, take a player, I'm not sure. The only other avenue to getting a first-round pick would be probably Boyan, who I would prefer the team keep for next season. Um, so, yeah, I think you guys covered it really well, though. Um, moving on to the next question here from Price Zimmer. Does this change the process or is this part of the process? The Monty Williams hire, I assume this is referring to. I mean... I I haven't got much right in my time with doing Pistons content, but I will say that for a while I said that I thought that Dwayne Casey would get fired, whatever, leave, but then move into the front office. Like, so that's one thing I've actually got right through this whole process. And so I do think, I guess to answer your question, I do think this was always part of it. Dwayne Casey would start out for a couple of years and then he'd move into the front office. And then you bring in a coach to kind of really grow with this team. And I think a six-year contract that could be eight years is something that really speaks to Monty Williams growing with this team. It's not just going to be a one year and they expect to be in the Eastern Conference Finals next year. I think Monty knows what he's signing up for. And I don't think it necessarily expedites or speeds up the process. I think it's been part of the idea that you got a coach to just grow once you have what you feel like is a pretty good young core. Yeah, no, I agree hundred percent with you. I mean, it feels like with the, the hesitancy that, that Monty Williams even had uh, in deciding whether to take the year off or come back. I mean, the longevity was likely really important to, to him in those contract negotiations. And I mean, it, it makes sense for all the reasons that, that you just said, you want a guy that is going to take all these young pieces you've accumulated and, and take it up to the next level. And I think that the length of the contract kind of implies that they think eventually he's a guy to take them potentially over the next level, even after that. Right. I mean, you're looking at potentially eight years if he really, really excels. I mean, who knows, maybe even longer. So no, I don't really think that it's going to speed up the process at all. I think since the season ended, they've been talking about trying to, take a little bit of a step, really improve, um, you know, somewhere maybe into the upper 20s, low 30s in terms of win total, uh, get closer to the play-in game and, and just keep progressing from there. So, no, I, I don't really think it's it's going to speed up anything. Do you, do you have anything more to add? No, I, just, I think what would speed up the process is just kind of what is available this offseason, right? Like if Jalen Brown really yeah. becomes available and the Pistons can really put a package together, which I don't think they can, and as you always remind me, even if you could put a package together for some of these things, can you put the best package together for those things? That's what speeds up the process. I think the biggest thing that truly speeds up the process is organic growth. That Cade, Ivy, Dur Duran are truly the three young star core players of the 
of the Detroit Pistons. You have good vets with Boyan and Burks. Whatever you do with five, whether it's another rookie, whether you trade it for you know OGN and you know add some sort of quality young player, whatever it is. But I think the most comes from just organic growth that, I mean, obviously we all want to see and probably needs to see happen. But I just, I think we have to temper our expectations just a little bit. Like I'm as excited as everybody, but Monty can't just change everybody at one time. Now I, I expect to see some differences, right? We've talked about Killian. That This is the perfect scenario for Killian. We all, no, we all, not all. A lot of us feel like Killian needed a new circumstance to really find his confidence and find his groove. Well, now he gets a chance to do it in Detroit. So maybe that happens, but I don't know that Monty's just a savior, you know, coming in that's going to take it to 50 wins unless there's organic growth and a talent influx and those type of things. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so moving on, uh, front of the show, Kyle Metz here is asking, does Monty increase the likelihood of Jeremy Grant coming back to Detroit? And he also adds on uh, potentially – Tory Craig as well. So uh, what are your thoughts on that one, Bryce? Yeah, I mean, I, that's the mold of what this team needs, right? It, it's some guys like that. I'm trying to connect any dots that I may not be aware of with Jeremy Grant. Is there a connection um, that I'm can't miss, th- oh, missing? Oh, Is there a DMV connection? I bet, I bet there's the OKC. Okay. When, so, when Monty was maybe an assistant that one year, that could be the only thing I can think of where maybe they overlapped. So that would be interesting, right? Like that's just another layer to this. We know Troy and Jeremy had a close connection. And so you now head coach in a connection with Jeremy Grant, there's a need. I still think the ultimate factor in whether Jeremy Grant's even available is what the Blazers decide to do, right? If the Blazers are in win now and they keep Dame, why would they let Jeremy go? And I realize, you know, like, I just don't see it. Now, if they trade Dame and they're going to draft Scoot at three and that's the future and they decide to rebuild and reset just a little bit. Now I think it's more likely that Jeremy actually leaves Portland. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm in the, the same boat with Jeremy Grant. And I think he's going to, he's going to ask for a lot of money too, which w- would make me a little bit hesitant, but I mean, just, just like you said with, with Grant specifically, he, he played fantastic basketball last season if the blazers are really going to load up and go back all in for it again like he's he's not only going to get paid he's still going to be in a feature role a a role that's almost perfect for what he is as a player where he can really excel and and continue to prove his worth uh, for the contract that comes after i mean portland's just such a great spot for him so i think unless they're not willing to come up on price then then maybe he'd move on. But I don't know if – like if that's the hang-up with Portland, I don't know if the Pistons are the team that's going to offer him the moon uh, contract-wise. So, I don't know. Go ahead, Jack. What are your thoughts on that one? Talking about Jeremy Grant. Um, Jeremy Grant. Yeah. Don't really see it, to be honest. I think you got like the Blazers situation. We have to see what happens there. Um, Bryce, I think there is, I think Jeremy's from the DMV. So I think there's that whole connection there as well. No, um, I, I, yeah, Jeremy's definitely from the DMV. Wasn't that the, ori- yeah. 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 So he's Monty. With Monty, there's, with Troy, there's always that DMV connection. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's everywhere. So that, I guess that, that's one reason to think, um, maybe, but I, yeah, I, I wouldn't be opposed to it. If it happened, he'd be an excellent piece for this team. Don't get me wrong. I just, don't really see it. I think you guys hit it perfectly. He's in the ideal role, which is why he came to Detroit to show he can do, you know, he can be that secondary or tertiary guy and he's there with Portland right now. And all signs from Portland are that, um, or at least some reporting is that they're looking to move that pick to bolster up their team to really make a playoff push. So I can't see Jeremy leaving. The Blazers. So yeah, Mon- awesome. Monty Williams is a Virginia, born in Virginia, high school in Maryland. So DMV stuff. I'm looking. So he was an associate head coach with the Thunder in 15-16. Jeremy played for OKC in 16, starting in 16-17. So I can't find where there's actual overlap with coach player. But um so there you go, Kyle. I, yep. Yeah, I think Jeremy was it with OK OKC okay, from the 16-17 season, which might have been the season after Monty left. So um 
but I'm not sure if you guys hit on it, but with the free agency stuff okay. with Mon DC, Maryland, Virginia. Uh, it's just a region in the United States, Camille. So I didn't know till I went to college there either, Camille. So we're <laughs> it's all good. Um, I just had a bit of a question for you guys. Um, do you think Monty's hire changes much for agency wise? I only say this obviously, Cam Johnson is a name that's been lit. Well, Pistons fans have wanted. I'm not sure if there's been any reporting that there is a link there, but now with Monty Williams on board, you presume that relationship could help sway him potentially. Um, there's also guys like Kelly Oubre, Javon Carter played under Monty Williams, Dario Saric are just some names that have played under Monty Wallace with the Suns. Do you think the Williams hire helps Lewis some free agents that might not have considered Detroit? Yeah, I mean, but I think it's because of what you just spoke on in just terms of all these relationships. But this is hard, man. Like, we just – these are the things we don't know. You know, he may have a great relationship with a player that he never even coached, right? Like, you go to these games beforehand and you see how the coaches interact with the players from other teams. And sometimes it's because they coach them, but maybe they just got to know each other. Wasn't it the Jeremy Grant, Damian Lillard thing from Team USA? Isn't that where that thing started? Yeah, you're so, right. So, yeah. you know, there's just all sorts of these different connections that sometimes we can see it, but I think sometimes we can't. So I, I think no matter what coach you brought in, Jack, I think you get some of that, right? Like Charles Lee was going to have some of that. Kevin Ollie probably had a completely different dynamic, you know, in some ways negative, but in some ways potentially positive. So um, sure. who knows what kind of connections there might be. Yeah, That's I think the, one, the only thing that we could actually know for sure now is it just kind of informs the type of players that you might be looking to target just based on what Monty Williams likes. So because we have all this coaching history with him, because we kind of know schematically what he generally likes to do, I mean, you could look at players that are now, you know, you, you filter down the list. You're looking for high field, good defenders, good shooters, ball movers, um, processor guys right so we it can help out in that way I, i'm not in terms of just for sure it's going to affect it and in, in anything else i mean i have no idea your guess is as good as mine sure all right let's hit another question here from truth teller 2011 i'm so excited by what this means for a player like duran yeah you you and me it's both statement. Love yeah it. no i mean yeah it's, it's a statement it's, yeah Ideally, theoretically, this will allow him to maximize what I think his ceiling is. And it's not just me. I think a lot of people saw it and have seen it and with his passing and, and I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't need to go into great detail. We've talked about it before, but yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like he's going to get a chance to show the skill set that a lot of us believe he has. Yeah, it's that playmaking potential, right? I mean, he, he can read the floor pretty well. He started to flash it a little bit in the short roll and some just standstill passing reads too at the end of the season. Like that all is just a, a perfect fit for what, what Monty Williams was doing in Phoenix. So, and he's still so young. There's, there's so much ceiling for there to grow. Monty's getting his hands on him early. You know, I mean, this is, yeah, it, it, it's a really good fit for Dern. It should be exciting. And just while we're on the topic of ceilings, I'd love to get your opinions on, of the Pistons' core three guys, who do you think has the highest ceiling out of Cade, uh, Ivy, Duran? I, I still think it's Cade. I mean, I didn't watch Jaden Ivy film and say face of the franchise player. And I truly do think I was higher on Jalen Duran's ceiling than anybody. Again, I didn't say this is your number one guy on a championship team. I've said Cade Cunningham from the beginning. He may not be your leading scorer. But Cade Cunningham can be the number one dude, the face of the franchise on a championship team. So nothing for me that's happened so far in his NBA career deters me from that, especially knowing he was playing through the injury. So like it, it's still Cade Cunningham for me. And I, I don't like when people say this, but for me, it's not even close. I understand if people see it a different way. I'm just saying for me, it's easily Cade Cunningham. I'm in the same boat, and I also don't think it's all that close. I mean, the the fact that you can look at Cade and you can squint and you can realistically see a guy that's putting up like 25, 8, and 8 on fairly efficient numbers and average to passable defense, like that's a 
foundational franchise guy, no matter how you cut that. And as much as we love, you know, Jaden Ivey's scoring potential, I love his scoring potential. I think Cade actually even averaged more points as a rookie than Ivy did. So I think Ivy's going to be a really great player. I, I still think the easy answer is Cade. Well, and it's also the intangibles. I think that's one thing we forgot, Jack, is like maybe Ivy has more athleticism, explosiveness, all that stuff. But I don't know. Maybe you disagree with me, but I don't look at Ivy or Duran and think leader of the team, face yeah. of the franchise in that way. You know what I'm saying? So I think that plays into an ultimate ceiling as well. For sure. I think, look, I probably think it's a bit closer than you guys. Um, I think it's it's Cade. But then I think Jaden, I think the thing with Jaden that I get most excited about is one, just the improvement he showed and just everything we hear about his work ethic. Like I know everyone talks about work ethic, but there, I heard Dwayne Casey just comment a lot on Jaden's work ethic and to see the improvements he made, I, I was, I was pretty stunned. I didn't expect that rookie season. Now where you, where you have me is with Kate is the intangibles. He's going to be the closer on this team. He's going to be the guy closing games in the clutch. We saw it as a rookie. Um, he's the leader. He's just got this aura about him that a franchise guy has. But I do think Jaden Ivey probably has much more potential as a scorer because of that athleticism. And the thing with Cade that worries me a little, and maybe it was the injury, is that for him to score, it always feels like he's got to take a ton of shots. And they, obviously, he doesn't get to the he doesn't get to the line that much, and maybe that's something that improves with strength. So, for me, Cade, that's where I have my my I guess the negatives on Cade for me are like I feel he's going to take a ton of shots to get up to that twenty five point range, and his efficiency to date hasn't been great. Neither has Jaden's. So, um, I just feel like Jaden's got a bit more potential in terms of getting scoring easier um, and potentially being the leading scorer on this team. Um, but it is still Cade, and I think it will be Cade ultimately. Um, I just think it's a touch closer between the I th two. I think where I'm stubborn with Cade stuff, and you're right, you're not wrong at all. I think there's some really bad efficiency metrics out there about Cade's rookie season. But I'm very stubborn about his three-point shot is going to be more yeah. like what it was in college than what it was in the 72 games we've seen. And as we know, whenever you're knocked out, knocking down threes – that's going to increase your overall efficiency, how many shots you need to take to get to. But, you, but you're not wrong because I, I don't know that he's going to be a high foul draw guy in the lane in the way Jaden was. Like he's almost more of one of those guys that just naturally avoids contact, not because he's scared of it, but just because he can control his body and do those things. Hopefully the added strength allows him to take the contact he does get and then just get more efficient with that stuff. But I'm just very stubborn about him as a three-point shooter. I'm Absolutely. in the same boat. I don't have anything else to add. All right. Let's move on then. Um, Camille. Shout out to Camille. He just supports everything. He's the man. Pistons Turkey. Go follow him on Twitter. Um, some fans think Duran will be similar to Aiton in terms of behavior and performance. What do you think about this? Okay. I, I, I don't know. I don't performance wise again like i think duran's a better passer and more athletic more bouncy um the behavior thing is the one that like i hope not right like i don't know whose fault that was or what happened but that wasn't a very good situation at all um i just i guess if we're gonna blame Aiden, i just don't see that being duran's mentality so i i, I don't know about that one yeah. No, I'm, I'm skeptical on the, the behavior part too, but I think performance wise there, I think there could be a little bit of overlap. I think they're different. They're different players. Aiton had a lot more, even like coming out of college, Aiton had more potential as a shooter than, than Duran ever did a little bit more as a little bit more natural dribbling the ball too, even though you don't really want him to do that all that much. Um, but I mean, in terms of the role that they ended up, deploying Aiden in is something I could see Dern really excelling at. So, I mean, potentially in a couple of years, you, you similar numbers, I guess, to Aiden's best seasons. I mean, yeah, I think that could totally be in the realm of possibility. For sure. I think with Duran, I don't really know what he's like off the court, but on the court, I haven't seen anything that would, I haven't seen him really give up on a play or, like obviously, he's made mistakes and 
that comes with being one of the youngest players in the league and being a teenager. Um, but I think his errors aren't from a lack of trying, which um, just talking to some Suns fans and just seeing obviously stuff on Twitter and that Aiton's effort at times can wane. So, um, but I, I'm not, none of, I don't have those sort of concerns, effort concerns with Duran at all. I guess if we're being totally fair, Duran did have those uh, effort and motor concerns coming out of uh, Memphis, but I don't think he really showed them all that much uh, the rookie year. I, I would hope those are behind him, but worth pointing out probably. Definitely. Definitely. Um, from YouTube user, I asked Bryce on his pod, but a lot of position things about Monty. What are some of the drawbacks? Casey was criticized. Positive things. Nice. I think he's saying a lot of positive things about Monty, oh, but what are some okay. of the drawbacks? I remember I remember it. Autocorrect gets us all, YouTube user. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'll, I'll just answer the same way I did there. The one thing, talking to people today, and it sounds like you talked to some people, Jack, so I'm interested to see if you got negatives. The one negative I got was that Monty wasn't very good adjusting in, within the playoffs, within a series, within a game, those type of things. And my main point was – I just have a hard time worrying about that right now with where this team is at and more importantly, all the other positives. Seems like he's a great person. Development of young players, the offensive scheme. I don't know how much credit we can give him for the defense because I don't know if it was his defense or an assistant and if he's going to bring that assistant with him. But there's just so many positives to outweigh that negative. Now, eventually it's going to come into play, right, guys? Like, Hopefully there, this is something that comes up but hopefully it's something he can learn from. And I want to take a quick second. Ku, I assume this is you in the in the, in the the chat. Shout out Ku, his wife. I won't drop her name because I don't know if he's comfortable with it or not, but she had a, a very serious surgery. Go check out any of our Twitters. I, I tweeted it out. There's a GoFundMe that they could use. You know, We all know how this works. And so I just wanted to shout out Ku and his wife. I think everything's going well all love and prayers and whatever you believe, whatever to Ku and her. And if you guys have the ability to help out with that, go check out somebody, you know, our Twitter, Ku's Twitter, whatever. And if you can donate, donate. I just wanted to, sorry, I wanted to stop real quick. It saw he was in here and, and, and drop that. So. No, well, well said. I echo everything you said, Bryce. And yeah, hope all is well, Ku. And Absolutely. thanks for jumping in. I'll, um, I'm going to drop the link in the comments to where you guys can go donate if, if you have the means to. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. All right. Uh, on on the, the question, I'm with you. I think the only thing I can think of as an immediate concern, and I don't even know if it'd be a concern. I mean, the eight, the fallout with Aiton is a little bit of a red flag. I don't know whose fault that was. I don't think we'll ever know. Um, but if you're looking for something to maybe pump the brakes on and not be as excited as you are because – you just don't like being happy, then then maybe look at that. That's all I've got. I mean, it's not nothing, right? Like he didn't talk to one of his best players for a whole off season. I assume that's not common. Nope. So, you know, I, I I feel like DeAndre gets all the hate for that and all the blame, and and maybe rightfully so. I don't know, but it's not nothing. And without knowing the full context of the situation and all that, just to your guys' point, I don't think that's Jalen Duran. Even if there are some legitimate motor concerns, which I do think were legitimate coming out of Memphis. I think it's more conditioning concerns, but it's also he's freaking monster at 18 years old. Like he just may not be able to get in yeah. good enough shape yet. But I don't think there's attitude hmm. concerns. I don't know if that's a thing with DeAndre Ayton or not, but um you know, I, I think it's at least fair to ask. So, sure. Which question are we on, guys? Sorry, I've just lost my train of thought. <laughs> I know. Between I thought we're me about... leaving, you leaving, the coup yeah. day, oh, yeah, all like we're the all over the place. And that's what makes live YouTube the best, man. I think I just, all I wanted to add, uh, Bryce, just in terms of uh, the drawbacks of Monty Williams, you hit them perfectly. Um, something I heard is being experimental with lineups and obviously adjusting in a He wasn't series. experimental with lineups? Yeah. Yeah, just oh, okay. so. Okay. But that was mainly in a playoff setting. So for me, okay. that doesn't okay. really bother me because 
where the Pistons are quite far off in the playoffs right now. This, this And this is the idea of bringing in that de- developmental coaches, getting them to the playoffs. Um, that's That was the thought behind bringing in someone like Kenny Atkinson and the job he did with Brooklyn. It's sort of just getting this team to develop winning habits so they're in a position to push for the playoffs. So uh, those are legitimate concerns for sure. But in the short term or even medium term, however you want to phrase it, that stuff doesn't bother me right now. And as you said, Bryce, the positives, everything we've discussed, heard, seen, written about, like it, they significantly outweigh any of the drawbacks right now. All right, I'm just I'm getting my thoughts back together here. The next question, I believe, is from Truth Teller once again. Hey, guys, what type of development do you expect from Duran under Monty, um, considering he has an infinitely higher motor than Aiton? So we sort of discussed this, but what's an area of Jalen Duran's game you're excited to see next season? Yeah, I'm, I'm just excited to see the development, whether, you know, I think it's going to happen, whether it was Monty or even if it was Dwayne or somebody else. You know, I just, I think he has a super high ceiling but it will be nice to see him in an offense. It still runs ball screens, right? Cause that's one area you want to use him. He's a lob threat. He can short roll, but also just a guy in general, that's going to be asked and be valued that can move the ball and pass the ball and not just say, Hey, go stand in the dunker spot or try to post him up a whole bunch or something like that. So he's going to be in an offensive system that I feel like fits his strengths and what his ultimate ceiling is. And I just think as a, a young player, we we should expect to see some really good growth and I'm excited for it. Yeah, I, I've said it uh, previously and I'm, I'm just going to echo the exact same thing. I think you're hoping for some of that defensive rotation awareness to improve. And I think yeah, you're hoping yeah. for more of the playmaking flashes. And like you said, I think you were hoping for that regardless of who the head coach is. And he's so young, he's so talented. It's, very much in play also regardless of who the coach was. So I think it's a great pair, uh, Duran and, and Monty Williams. And yeah, I'm just excited to see, see what happens with it. Yeah, for sure. You guys have hit it perfectly. Um, the next question here from coffee is with Gores wanting to win now and hiring Williams, how does that affect Weaver's restoration plans? I think this is an excellent question. Do do you guys think this was about just about winning now though? Like I, I think I'm I think I'm way off base because I just I know they to me this bot gores some time, right? Like he went out and spent big money and there's positive momentum and he, people are probably going to want to buy tickets now and those type of things. I I don't again, I go back to the length of the contract. If Gores was winning now, I don't think that we would have – maybe this is what it took just to get Monty, but I still think that there's some patience from the front office and he bought some goodwill that had been lost by going out and getting the hottest name on the market and by being able to say, look how much money. I put my money where my mouth is. And so I don't think it's necessarily a win now. Now, don't get me wrong. This team has to show improvement. They have to win more than 17 <laughs> games, probably more than like like 25 games. Like hopefully they're pushing for 30. But I don't think it was just a completely win now move. If they they're gonna show us if they want to win now based off the players they acquire and those moves this offseason. I don't think necessarily just based off the coach. Yeah, no, I, I agree with, with everything you said. And I think that if um, there is a shift from, you know, young potential swings to a little bit more proven uh, players, that was going to happen anyway. I mean, again, like the messaging coming out of that front office and out of ownership was they wanted to be better next year, right? They didn't want to be 17 games at at the bottom of the standings two years in a row, well, three years uh, almost in a row. So, um, yeah, I don't think – that bringing in Monty Williams really shifts any focus from anything that was already in play. You know, I think they're still looking for young talent and they, they just want to take a little bit of a step. So no, I, I don't think Monty really, really changed anything. No, not at all. I think if maybe they brought in a Nick nurse, Frank Vogel, um, even Mike mm-hmm. Budenholzer, I would maybe be more inclined to, go down that track but I still view Monty with all the success he's had of late I still view him as a coach 
who who leans into developing players and that that's something that he has had success with um not to say those other coaches couldn't do something like that i just don't think they're as inclined to take over a job like the pistons and i don't think they were interviewed for it so but to answer the question i don't think it shifts the plan at all and the can contract we leave that, can we leave this one up here i'm interested to get your guys' thoughts so just talking big picture with this in terms of more experienced players or young untapped players. I'm curious because I think a lot of this off season comes down to one thing. Do you think you have your young core in Cade, Ivy and Duran? And if you do, then you don't have to take some of the big swings in the draft or free agency or make a big trade or whatever. So I'm curious where you guys are on that. Do you think those three are enough of a, I'm not saying that that's the core that's going to take you to a championship. I'm not saying you don't have to add any other big time talent. I'm just saying, do you think, or maybe answer it this way. Do you think the organ organization is comfortable with, okay, we have these three young guys that have star superstar potential and that's enough. Or do you still think they are seeing like, man, we, Amin Thompson, man, like he could be a superstar. Like it's probably still worth taking a swing on that. Where, where are you guys at on that? Just kind of big picture. Wes, I'll let you go first. Yeah. All right. Um, I was seeing if you were going to go first. This is a tough question. Um, so I, as positive as we've been talking about Jalen Duran, he's the only one that makes me pause because I think his – just with how young he is and how I guess undervalued centers are like, there's a little bit of reason to be concerned with, you know, does he even get there? And if he does get there, is that really the, you know, foundational star you want to be, you want to be building a, a whole system around uh, as the third, third banana of a trio. So I think probably not, you know, you probably want to add one more guy at five, but I know Bryce, you and I have talked, me saying this doesn't necessarily mean that I want to take the big swing at five, which is really not consistent with everything I just said. Um, I think you're just, I'd prefer to just add young talent regardless and try and figure it out later. So a sure thing is a little bit more exciting to me, but I mean, yeah, I am. I'm only hesitant on Duran. If there's more guarantee on his future, I'd be a lot more excited about the trio. Yeah, I think that's an excellent answer. I, all I would say is I'm still – there's part of me that's still not sure if Detroit has that number one guy. Um, it's positive and as high as I am on these guys, I'm still not sure. And if I, I'm talking through the lens of, like, Eastern Conference Finals Championship, like which is a high expectation, but that's what you should be building towards, especially going through a rebuild like this. I'm still not sure they have that guy. There's part of me – that wonders if, hence why I still would like them to draft the best available pay, player in this draft because I do think there's a situation in a season or two where Detroit package these young guys to bring in a more established all-star guy to play alongside Cade or whoever that player will be. And so that that's sort of how I feel about the core. Exciting, still very young, a lot of development to play out. Neither of those three guys have played 82 games yet, which is which is interesting True. and um, sort of shows the injury setbacks that Cade's dealt with. Um, so exciting core, still a lot to be figured out, in my opinion. All right. Next question here is from Chris. Do you think Monty has a word on who we draft? If so, who do you think he prefers? I mean, I think, yes, you have to, he has to have a voice, right? But Amari brought up a good point when we talked about this earlier. I mean, he can't just come in and be the voice or how disrespectful is that to all of your current scouts and those type of guys that have been grinding away for 12 months and ideally you trust in. And so, yeah, like, again, I think one of the players that could possibly have made the biggest leap, and I'm not saying all of a sudden he's more in play. I'm just saying could is Anthony Black. Like I could see Monty walking in and say, man, this kid really, really, really fits what we like. I think, Wes, you hit it nail on the head in terms of Whitmore, Walker, Whitmore, Walker. What's going to break the tie? Oh, we have a coach now who values high processing, quick decisions. 
maybe we go with Jairus Walker, you know, or maybe I know Koo wants to talk about a man at some point, like a man Thompson is, you know, one of his draws is a high processor, quick decisions, those type of things. And so like, I think it can be a tiebreaker now, but I think it'd be disrespectful to the scouting department if he comes in and just has the overwhelming voice. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think that's spot on. And we, we did, we kind of touched on it earlier, but yeah, directly, I think the the most impact Monty Williams is going to have is like you just said, when all else is equal and you got a coin flip, then you can, you can lean it one way or another in terms of who, he prefers, I, I have no idea, probably high processors, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really know. It could be anyone. He could he could surprise people, too. I mean, uh, I don't think McCall Bridges was really known as a, a big processor guy coming out, and they he certainly turned out really well in Phoenix. M- Mikkel was on the list of the ones I did with Cam Whitmore yep. in terms of his fresh. Now, somebody debugged that a little bit and, and added in the usage percentage, and, and that was something that, that was interesting. Here's the other thing. Coaches have egos. Every coach, I don't care how good Monty Williams is, uh, how good of a person, every coach has an ego. And you know what egos like, to, or know what coaches like to do? They like to fix players. They like to show how good of coaches they are. So it yeah. wouldn't put past me to for Monty say, big time athlete. I believe in his shot. He can defend. I can teach him how to play the way I want him to play. And so if it ends up being Cam Whitmore, I could see it being that. Just like hey. I can I can be the one that teaches this kid to have the feel to play the game the way we want him to play. You're speaking from experience, Bryce. <laughs> and usually was <laughs> it usually was wrong. So, <laughs> um, next question here from Cedric: How does a Hayes for Pat Williams swap look if Pistons eat Lonzo Ball's remaining contract as the incentive? So just I heard this morning on um Keith Smith's podcast, the names are escaping me, but there's actually potential that well, there's thoughts, legitimate thoughts and concerns that Lonzo's career could be over due to this knee injury. So just wanted to add that in for the context. Yeah. I, I'm avoiding this question. Wes? I, <laughs> no, I, I, no, in all seriousness, I, I've said even before this that I think Killian should get till the trade deadline to see. Like, I want to see a, a another how many ever games that is. And again, by all accounts, this is an offense that should really fit in. There's still going to be ball screen stuff, but a high field guy. So I'm I'm cool. I'm cool with Killian still. I mean, Pat Williams is a really good player, though. So like, I mean, if I said I wanted to make the trade, it would have a lot more to do with the fact that I think Pat Williams is a good player than like, oh, we got to get Killian out of town or something like that. Yeah, no, I, I don't know how the, the fit really is. I really I also I really love Pat Williams. I think he's still got a lot of potential and he's been really up and down uh, in Chicago. So I, I could envision them maybe wanting to to get off of him and move him. But I'm not sure that the Bulls would want Killian Hayes when they've got an Alex Caruso already. And those two are, I mean, Caruso is a better player, but more or less fairly similar molds. Um, and it might just also be way more valuable for them at this point to see if Lonzo Ball can play basketball at some point in the future, since he's also a, a very good player. So I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure that there's a fit on that one. On mute again, my bad. Um, next question here from John Buck. With Kate and Ivy both being able to run point, we need we need a two more than killing in a playoff rotation. Do we need a two? Gotcha. Typo again. Yeah, Got my, my bad, guys. <laughs> Maybe Wes should read the questions out. He's a bit quicker than I am. <laughs> no, it's only because I'm not reading them that I'm getting it. <laughs> I mean, I feel like Killian's a decent – like the, the idea behind Killian, right, is he can take the primary perimeter matchup, so neither of those guys has to. I still think it comes down to Killian. Does the shot come around? So, you know, I I, I just think – no, I mean, I think it's okay. I think the idea of what we want Killian to be still makes sense. What it comes down to is does Killian become that? Right. Yeah, the, the idealized version 
of Killian Hayes is a, a guard that can really pass the ball, shoots the ball at league average off the catch, and then is also a very, very good defender. And that guy would be great playing one or two off the bench in, in the playoffs in a three guard rotation when you when you turn that rotation down from ten to eight. So if if Killian can't be that guy, then no, I think he he's still got a, a spot um long term. If he can't, then you're probably looking for someone else that can do the same things. Yeah, with Killian, it always feels like it just comes down to the shot from three. Because I think it's easy to forget he's like six five. So he can really mm. be that. He can play at the two as an off guard alongside Ivy or Cade. Like if he could just get to league average, that's a that's a valuable player in a playoff rotation, in my opinion. It's and you just, don't it's, and you don't lose secondary player. playmaking. You know, we always talk about having a secondary playmaker. Like he can still do that. So for sure. All right, guys, we're we're going to wrap up in about ten minutes here. So we're going to try and rapid fire through these questions. So. Thanks for all the questions, guys. Like, honestly, I haven't even been able to keep up. As you've seen, I can barely read them half the time. So we, we, we really appreciate the support. Um, so the next question here from Greg. What do you guys think about the Pistons front office approach and structure? Stan Van Gundy, Casey, Monty Evolution, Weaver's current role. Are we, are we more of a group decision? Yeah, I mean... Uh... I like where things are at right now, I guess is the best answer I can give in terms of I like Dwayne Casey in the front office. I like Monty Williams as a head coach. I've lost a little bit of faith in Troy Weaver. Um, that has to do with some other decisions outside of just on court things. But I mean, I still think he can build a championship team and he's got a lot of big decisions to prove that this off season. Um, you know, so I, I, overall, I, I think I'm positive with it. I'm happy with it. I, I don't know how the decisions truly come down. That that would be interesting. I would love to know that. I'd love to be a fly on the wall in some of those meetings to know who has the voice and who gets told to be quiet and who gets ignored. But I just don't know that that, that we have that type of information. Yeah, I think Greg's pointing out something something interesting and in, in just the the types of coaches and in in roles that Gores has tried to fill since he's been owner. I, I mean, I don't know if there's much to it, but it, it is interesting at, at surface level that you, you convince Stan Van Gundy to come out of the broadcast booth, right? You give him big money and you tell him like, hey, you're going to run the whole show because he's got the front office, the GM power as well. And then you come off of that and, and you fall back into Dwayne Casey and kind of a, an advisory GM in uh, Ed Stefanski for a while. And, I mean, had your pros and cons with that as well. And then you end up falling into Troy Weaver and pairing him with Dwayne Casey. And that ends up driving really well. And now you finally land on Monty. I mean, it's definitely an interesting growth and, and, and evolution on how these processes have continued. I, I don't mean, I don't know if there's much of a takeaway from it, but I, I think it's interesting watching that that happen in real time for sure. Yeah, I guess my opinion on the front office is it feels like it did feel like a portion there that there might have been too many cooks in the kitchen, this coaching search. Um, just with the reporting regarding Weaver having a preference in his guy and um, maybe the rest of the Pistons brass weren't aligned in that sense, but maybe that's just, uh, you know, I've never been in a front office clearly, so maybe that's, that's sort of par for the course. But um, it seems to be a front office that, and led by Troy that if they want to get someone, they do everything they can to get that player. Troy, we saw with James Wiseman, Tom Gores with his coaching search and history. Um, so take that for what you will. Um, yeah, I think where with just with Troy Weaver specifically, I think he's done a pretty good job scouting and bringing in talent. Now it's sort of like putting that talent together into a roster that wins games wins more than it loses and climbs to standing so and i think um that's where we'll from this point onwards that's where we're going to start to see what troy River is really like as a general manager um next question here is from ku thank you bryce for bringing our man up i have a question for you all. why is a man looked at as a prospect player that won't fit yeah i mean I've Wes and I have talked about this in text messages. 
I have a major issue with people who said Scoot Henderson couldn't be the pick because of fit, but then want a Min Thompson. Now to Coos point, that wasn't me. Like I wasn't saying that Scoot couldn't work especially offensively. And this is what I told Wes the other day. There's an argument that Amin is a better fit than Scoot because of what he can take on defensively. So my reservations ever about not taking Amin Thompson has nothing to do with fit. I think he has an extremely high ceiling. I think he can be a really good defender. Um, you know, if you think Asar, Asar barely shoots better than him, it drives me like he barely shoots better than him. And everybody's like, oh, Asar's such a better fit. He, he, he still shot low 30% from three and he's not as good getting to the rim and all of these other things. So we don't have to get into the Amin Asar debate. So I, I don't think, I mean, I think it would be an interesting fit. I think you'd have to work some things out, but he fits the Monty Williams wants to do. And so um, I'm still very intrigued in Amin. I just, as you and I have talked about, Jack, he's so hard to evaluate because that basketball was just so bad. And I hate to say it so bluntly, but it just, man, it, it, it it's hard to evaluate that. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. I, Ross, no, I think, oh, go ahead. Um, because I, I've been very high on a man and Ross, you've, you've outlined it perfectly. So I don't think the fit, I think that's not the best argument for why you wouldn't take a man. Um, but the more film I've watched, I've just, I've really struggled to sort of evaluate. Like, I think the athleticism, there's so much that's going to translate for Amen. This, I don't think you don't take him in the top five or anything like that. I just think it's the defensive potential is there. But some of the stuff I watched just on Synergy and just in games, it's just, it's really hard to evaluate. I said to Bryce, how the hell are you evaluating this stuff? <laughs> like, it's tough. So, um, that competition stuff has the more I've dug into it, it has concerned me a little, but um, yeah, I still, if the Pistons could take a man Thompson at five, I would be, I think that's an excellent choice. Yeah. The only thing I, I'd add fit wise, and this is something that, that you've brought up a few times to me, Bryce is like when you're comparing Scoot and a man uh, offensively, at least. So defensively, it's clearly the better fit with a man Thompson than Scoot. But offensively, Scoot Henderson is the level of prospect where you'd feel comfortable taking the ball out of Cade and Ivy's hands, where Amen Thompson really isn't. So offensively, you'd be asking him to majority of the time play a lot off ball. And I don't know, do you, do you think that could be a big issue for him uh, just in terms of fit in Detroit? Yeah, I mean, I think it's more about mentality, right? I don't think it's like he doesn't have the physical tools to do it or the feel for the game to do it. It'd be more about like, can he change his mindset of, okay, when I'm on the floor with Cade and Ivy, I'm probably not going to be the one running the ball screen. Like you could still do it. I mean, I think a man can run a ball screen and create and do those things. But yeah, there's going to be some time off the ball. And as we know, like, well, it sounds like it's easy. We see NBA players all the time who refuse to play off the ball. Looking at you, Trey Young, refuses to do anything, but just go stand in the corner off the ball. Now, completely different athletes. But I think a man has all the things that would be necessary to do that. It's just a mentality thing. I, I, I always want to say this about these two kids. All of the intel that we get to hear is that it's really good. They're great kids. They're hard workers, all of that stuff. And so, like, I do always want to bring that up. And Ku brought up some of the film, NBL. Like, I'll have to look into I guess all I've seen on Synergy is the the OTE stuff. So I'll have to find that, that film on Synergy because I guess I haven't come across it. All right, next question here from Erwin. We've got three more to go. Um, what do you think about the length of Monty's guaranteed contract coinciding with Cade hitting his peak at 27, 28 year old. The timing intrigues me. Yeah. I think it just means like either they're competing for championships together and going to extend or Cade didn't hit and both of them are going to be out of Detroit. So I guess it makes sense that, you know, if this thing is going by that time, this thing's going one way or the other. Yeah. Agreed. It is. It is interesting that it times up so nicely with that, uh, just about to enter enter the the prime as a player but yeah if at that point they're not at the level where they need to be you you're looking at bigger changes than just Monty Williams so i i think that was probably intentional excellent answers you got nothing to add next question here from Richard Brooks this is a good one if you had to pick one draft prospect to guard Jason Tatum who would it be 
Ooh. I'll just give a quick answer. I'll just say Jarris Walker, but yeah, that's just a first mind. I, I said, are, are we? We're assuming of the six that we're talking about for the Pistons, right? Not like just any draft prospect. Well, maybe if there is someone no, else, I, right, I think. Yeah, if there's someone that comes to mind outside the top six, I'd be interested to hear that. Well, like I said, I'm sure because, like, I think Casey Wallace is a big time defender, but he's not going to guard Jason Tatum. Some of these other guys aren't necessarily proven either. I like Andre Jackson. Like, now we're moving to, into like second round dudes. Oh, Max, the, the kid out of Marquette, who I think is a option at 31. Yeah, I, I think the twins have more of an argument here than maybe what some people would, would think. Um, Who's the worst? Taylor Hendricks? Twins, Black, Cam, Jer- Yeah. Taylor Which Hendricks is the scare me. Just because he's sh- how short he is. Short, I think Cam, yeah. I, and then I hate him moves off ball a whole heck of a lot. So that's what I was going to say is Cam, I think Cam is really good on the ball. Cam makes me nervous off yeah. the ball right now. But I don't think Taylor Hendricks could hold up at all. I, well, you I watched the right. Thompson twins, Jack. Like, do you think they're disciplined enough to guard some? Like, no rookie is. So this is a little unfair. But do you think they're disciplined enough to do it? The thing with Tatum is you can just say mm-hmm. guard him and don't do anything else. Just go guard him, and maybe that's the best I thing to do with it. those. I'm sort of just struggling because it's like, I guess the question is if you had to pick one draft prospect, so they're going to be rookies. They're going to be the size they are now, most likely. Yeah, I don't really like the Thompson twins. I think they might be able to disrupt and steal the ball, but in terms of just sticking with Tatum for a whole game, I sort of do like Cam Whitmore on ball, on ball. But I mean, ball. the 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 names are all in the second Nick's round: strength. Andre Jackson, Omax Prosper, Julian Phillips, Jordan Walsh. Like those are the guys that you're Jordan talking Walsh, about. Yeah, yeah, that's but someone Lob- I've been super intrigued in. Bilal Koulibaly, like those are guys that that you're going to put on Tatum. And, you know, those aren't guys that you're taking at five. It's a fun question, though. Awesome question yeah, from Richard. All right. Final question is from Camille once again. If you could trade a non-all-star level role player for the team, who would it be? Ooh. I'm not going first. I, I'm I'm so bad at these questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably I'm, I'm probably going to say an all star player. So I, who oh, who's the best? The who's the best three? In, who's the best three and D? Mikael Bridges. He hasn't been an all star. Okay, there you go. <laughs> but you I go. feel like he's going to be an all star. But that's that's who I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I would say the best three and D wing that's never been an all star. Like I just think or forward. OG is a good call as well. OG is a good one. Um, so, what about uh, DeAndre Hunter? That's not a bad one. I mean, I Eric. think he's he's not really realized as a player yet, but he's a 3 and D guy loosely. I could Aaron see that. Gordon's not a good Aaron, Aaron Gordon's a good call. Aaron yeah. Gordon would be great. Yeah, yeah Aaron he, Gordon would be awesome. That's a, real, that's a really good fit. Jeremy so. Grant. <laughs> Jeremy Grant. I've spoken about him just a little bit. I'm trying to think of any others. I guess if you want to swing on Pat Williams, he came up earlier too. There's a lot of potential there. Well, because he's been shooting the ball well. Like, you know, he's he knocked down shots this year. I think it just speaks to what this team needs, right? Yeah. Wings. Oh, this is an awesome one. Jaden McDaniels. From the Timberwolves, yeah. PJ Washington. Caleb Martin. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to give me Eastern Conference Finals, Caleb Martin, then uh, yeah. No, I'll take that. <laughs> um, all right, guys. I think we'll leave it there. This has um, been awesome. Wes and Bryce have done the back-to-back. They've, did, they've come fresh off from recording an episode on the Pistons Pulse. So be sure to go check that out. But um, yeah, thanks to Wes and Bryce for jumping on. Um, this has been an awesome show. Um, thanks to everyone who submitted questions tonight. Appreciate the support. And special thank you to Sean Corp, the managing editor of Detroit Bad Boys, for supporting the show. And shout out to everyone once again for all the questions, talking points, statements. Um, yeah, I think we've just cracked around subscribers. 
on YouTube. So really appreciate the support. Support If you haven't already, like and subscribe. Until then, join us next Thursday from 8pm to talk more Pistons hoops.